That's it setting up on one screen, but I think it records a little early. Uh. So. <laughs> there we go. Good evening, everybody. And I am here at Vintage Books Live with Kelly Brenner. Kelly is the author of The Naturalist at Home, which, which just came out yesterday. And um, she's also uh, the author of Nature Obscura, which came out in 2020, didn't it? Yep, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yes, yeah, <laughs> about the same. Yeah, we, we, you and I had books coming out at the yep. same time. <laughs> anyway, um, she's here to talk to us tonight, mostly about the newer book, but I'm actually going to ask her some about the older book too. <laughs> Um, so we're very happy that you can be with us. And if you want to ask any questions at any point, um, go ahead and put them in the chat. And I'm keeping an eye on it so that I can catch them and, and ask Kelly. Um, just know that sometimes the YouTube is a little bit delayed um, because we're live on Zoom and then feeding to YouTube. So um, if we take a couple minutes to answer your question, just we will get to it, I promise. <laughs> So Kelly, I was going to start out with a little bit like backing up a little bit and just curious how you got it started writing because, you know, you've been writing about nature for quite a while now. Yep. And what got you started in that? Um, a bad job market. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated with a degree in landscape architecture. And the year I graduated was 2009. And the firms were all not only not hiring people, but they were actively laying off most of people. And so I started writing because I liked writing and I was interested in urban wildlife habitat and I just kept going. So <laughs> that's that. I, yeah. Just yeah. Kept writing yeah. And here I am. What were you, some of your early writing gigs that you had? Uh, mostly it was my website. And then I did a few um, small freelance things like locally. And then it just kind of kept building until yeah. I got a book. So. And then Nature Obscure came out in 2020, right when the pandemic hit. I think Kelly and I had book releases right around the same time, because didn't it come out in April? April 1st, April Fool's. That's yes. not funny. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no. And I was all excited because it was coming out on my birthday, and then it didn't turn out to be quite as good as we had <laughs> hoped. But tell me a little, tell us a little bit about that book. I, I have that book. I don't have it with me here, so I've gotten to read it. But tell tell me a little bit about how that book came to be um, and, and why you wanted to write it and maybe a few fun things that you learned along the way. Um, I was really, well, I still am into urban wildlife habitat. And um, I was living in Eugene, of course, in Oregon, go to school and then moving to Seattle. And um, I mean, Eugene's not big, but it's still a city. Yeah. And moving to Seattle was, you know, a bit um, shocking. <laughs> It's a lot bigger and there's a lot less um, nature, like easily accessible. So I kind of had a mission to like find all the nature in the city. And I just kept um, thinking about it and writing about it. And so eventually I just decided I was going to write a book on the urban nature of the city. Um, I wasn't necessarily like, focused on Seattle. I just wanted to write about urban nature. But since that's where I was, I kind of that's and those are experiences I had, you know, like finding muskrats or beavers or dragonflies in the city. Um, and it just kind of just kept going. And then eventually. Um, I took a writing program and I was interviewed by the Seattle Times and they asked about what I was working on. I said I was going to work on a book and then the publishers contacted me and said, hey, how about that? Yay. That's awesome. And it, it, the first book was Mountaineers too, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, I thought. yeah. We really like Mountaineers at Vintage <laughs> Books. They, they put out some really, really beautiful books. Yep. Um, and I the, the chapter from that one that I remember the most is the one about moss, which I mm -hmm. really loved. Can you talk a little bit about going to the moss garden? Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, you have to take the ferry over across the Puget Sound to, um, to the island um, and drive all the way to the end of it to where the moss garden is. It's the Bloedel Reserve. Um, and it's a really old garden. <laughs> it's a very interesting garden. It's just, like the moss aspect is, um, is one piece of a larger um, uh, connected gardens by um, Richard Haig, who is a very famous, very, very, very famous um, landscape architect who's from Seattle. Um, and like, there's like the, you know, like typical garden, you know, like botanic garden type areas. And then there's this <laughs> Japanese garden. 
And then there's this just big mossy, mossy area that looks like it's you know prehistoric. It looks very old and it's dripping with moss everywhere. And um, and you just feel like there's a dinosaur gonna walk out of the the you know the woods. Oh, but, very um, cool. And it's just, I mean, when I was there, it was the middle of the day. So it was just really quiet and peaceful. And um, the, yeah, the, it's just tons of different mosses. And it's just like, you want to lay down and take a nap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. So you wrote Nature Obscura. And then, you know, a year and a little bit later, got the email, I'm assuming, from the Washington State Book Award saying that it was a finalist. <laughs> And unfortunately, we didn't get to celebrate that year because of COVID. <laughs> so we got gypped out of our celebration. But um, did that book um, lead to the book that you're like, it, in some way, did one book sort of lead to the other with the book that you just it came did with? directly? <laughs> so after I wrote Nature Obscura, people kept asking me, especially for the tardigrade chapter, like, how do you find tardigrades? Um, and so I started writing articles on my website, telling people how to, you know, I was asking the questions, like, how do you find tardigrades? Well, this is how you do it. And I wrote like three or four articles about that. And the publisher contacted me again and said, hey, let's write a book about that. <laughs> so great. yeah, no, directly the questions from Nature Obscura as readers directly okay. led to this book. And how did you choose um, the topics that you were going to write about? What did you... Did you have more than you would that you ended up putting in the book that you, you know, had to cut some out and you just picked the best ones or how did you um, make a decision about what to include? My bias. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You're right. You can do that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I like invertebrates the best. So that's, that's, um, that's what I focused on first, <laughs> how to find yeah. the invertebrates and, and learn about them. And then um, I realized that I should probably, you know, put the other things in there too, you know, like mammals and whatnot. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> you know, I had to like put some other things in there. Um, um, but I had a couple other things that I might have included, but mostly it was just, it was a pretty simple and set um, list of activities or projects that, and, and I did like the 20 or yeah, 20 projects. And then there's a bunch of side activities too, yeah, like bonus yeah. activities um, that go with those projects. Um, so there's quite a few of different, I, I kind of managed to squeeze a, a bunch more in there that are just side, you know, um, yeah. activities. So. <laughs> so I assume you had, you actually did them all and had to figure out how to explain them. And yep. so did you have times where you just, your whole house is taken over by. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them were seasonal so it kind of kind of yeah, just went you know and yeah. a lot of them are still I still have out like my um well my wetland in a jar I'd actually done that ages ago so that was one that I had previously done and then some I had to experiment with and some um yeah and some are still ongoing <laughs> yeah yeah so I was just wondering about the word naturalist it's kind mm. of evolved over the years um had various, you know, ups and downs and its level of prestige and that kind of thing. But for you personally, what do you, what, how do you define a naturalist? I actually wrote about that in the very beginning of the book. Um, Cause this is a topic that <laughs> is kind of a pet peeve of mine and I'll read it to you if I can find it real quick. Yeah. That'd be um, great. Um, hold on. I've read my own book. I promise. <laughs> Yeah, the problem with publishing is you finish it and you send it off and then it's months right. later, right? And so you're like, right, yeah, you're like it's in there later. somewhere, right? I, I'm pretty sure it's there. <laughs> I know I wrote this. I just don't remember. Okay, here it is. What is a naturalist and why should you be one? Um, so many people have offered a variety of opinions about what makes a person a naturalist, both historically and in modern times, like you just said. <laughs> um, but let me offer my own definition first. A naturalist is someone who observes, studies, documents, or otherwise learns about the natural world. Um, so that's that's my that's my opinion on what a naturalist is. And I, because I really, really, really dislike the term amateur naturalist. Because, I mean, there really aren't any professional naturalists. Yeah. I mean, there's a few yeah. here and there who worked for nature centers. But I mean, just the whole idea of an amateur naturalist is like, you're not good enough to study nature. You're not good enough to look at nature. Yeah. So I, I want to like challenge that and just say like, everybody can go out there and look at nature you yeah, don't have to yeah. like have some sort of degree or any sort of you know certificate or anything you just if you go out and you're interested yeah. in it and you spend a lot of time with it then you're a naturalist yeah 
I I wholeheartedly agree. I think it's very frustrating and kind of a loss that something that was open to everyone when science was first getting started, mm-hmm. you know, they referred to people as naturalists. Yep. They didn't necessarily refer to them as scientists because back then, of course, they're there wasn't really formal training for science. You were just tinkering around with it and trying to figure it out. And there was, you know, there were humans like to have like prestigious groups and everything. So the ins and the outs. So, I mean, you know, those that sprang up fairly immediately, but it still was more open. People could contribute more without the degree and I think what I feel sad about now is a lot of times people feel like, well, I don't have a degree in science, so I can't do science. And it's like, well, that's not really true. Like anybody yep. can do science and, yep. you know, we're, we're kind of, we're hardwired to do it. Um, and so it makes me sad when people just kind of cut them out of themselves yep. out of the picture because, well, I'm not a scientist or I don't. I don't get math or whatever. And it's like, no, you can, you don't yep. know what it is. You go out in your backyard. Right. And <laughs> right. And I, yeah, that's, that's like a huge reason why I wrote this book. Cause it's a, accessible to everybody. There's no ivory tower. You can just do it. And you can do these same experience experiments that the, a lot of these are ones that scientists use. Yeah. Like we're lazy yeah. funnel and, you know, pond dipping and whatnot. Yeah. It's the yeah. same ones. Um, my versions don't kill them, the insects, but um, just, you know, cause we want to observe them and watch their behavior. But but yeah, I don't want to break down that wall. I don't like yeah, the ivory yeah. tower. Make it accessible Can for you everyone. Talk a little bit, because I happen to know that you've gotten, you know, some small amount of notoriety for for a, a certain collection of yours. Um, I happen to be watching <laughs> Oregon Field Guide a few months back, and I was like, oh my god, I know that person. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Kelly was on Oregon Field Guide. Uh, I don't even remember. It's been never all the months run together but it's been a little <laughs> while um for her slime study of slime molds and i think that's case in point i mean here's you mm-hmm. and this other person in oregon who has gone out and just studied this for the love of it and then you know between the two of you has amassed a fair amount of knowledge that otherwise wouldn't be there and so can you talk a little bit about both about the experience of studying slime molds and just the experience of like having sudden fame for being the slime mold <laughs> queen. <laughs> it is so it spawned from from Nature Obscura when I wrote the chapter on slime molds. And I mean they were kind of cool and all, but then I wrote the book and I got completely obsessed. Cause there's like this thing called slime mold that most people have never heard of. Yeah. And I go out into the forest and I'm squatting behind a log and people are like, what are you doing? Looking for slime molds? Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll just walk away slowly <laughs> and it's funny because I told that to Oregon Field Guide and then they actually recorded that happening <laughs> the lady walks by okay oh, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but yeah so I just I just started like because when I wrote the book I wanted to go see a slime mold collection so I called there's you know this is Seattle we've got a university we've got museums yeah. nobody had slime molds so I kept calling, like my, my geographic range kept getting bigger and bigger. So I ended up going to having to go to um, Canada to see slime molds because that was the closest um, collection that I could see. So I thought, that's just that's just silly. And then the, the woman I wrote about in the chapter, her name was Julia Malister. And she was an amateur naturalist, but she was, her and her father, like they were more knowledgeable than the experts and the proper scientists. Yeah. So I was yeah. so inspired by her and what she did. Um, and she had a big collection. and they didn't hoard them. They shared them with everybody. So I just, the whole idea of like having a collection and just having it accessible and and learning from it. And um, it it was learning from it. Cause I, and I still can't identify a lot of them. I mean, I'm still learning um, in fits and starts, but it just, yeah, like there's the idea that there's so much out there that is accessible to us, that the common person like us, (laughs) who aren't proper scientists yeah. can, you know, learn about and become experts. And now I have people <laughs> constantly emailing me about slime molds and <laughs> so it's kind of, it's kind of fun to create a whole new um, window into 
Yeah. Something that most people don't know about. You don't have to yeah. be anybody special. You just have to have an interest. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I know that like just from the little bit of amounts of research I've done on like insects and other invertebrates that the thing that's exciting about them is there are very likely insects and invertebrates that have not been discovered Mm. in everybody's backyard because there's so many that we just don't know about yet with no one's ever either no one's ever really formally cataloged them people have probably seen them but nobody's really um and that just excites me for me and it excites me as a writer for kids because I always want kids to understand Mm -hmm. that not everything's a done deal like I think a lot of times especially because you get science books and everything that are just sort of this is how it is this is everything you need to know and there's not necessarily a lot of conveying the idea of how much we still don't know and mm-hmm. how much there is to left to, to to find out about. So I for me personally, that's always something I wanted to communicate in this in the writing that I do is that hey, we don't know all this stuff. <laughs> you know, right. whether it's formal or informal, you can go out and try to figure stuff out and and what we do know is often wrong or incomplete. Yes, so. yes exactly. Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, leeway to learn. So the other thing that I've been dying to ask you about, and I'm taking advantage of the fact that I'm interviewing you to ask a question that I <laughs> wanted to ask. <laughs> and I'm I'm not even sure I'm going to pronounce them correctly. That you have also done a lot of work with um, looking at is it nudibranchs? Yes. Is that how you- Yep. Yep. Rhymes with bank. Yep. And when you first started a while back, when you first started posting photos, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know. Like I knew what one was and I'd seen them in, you know, various textbooks and stuff, but I wasn't aware that they were like a West coast thing. I mean, I, I guess I had somehow gotten in my mind that maybe they were somehow tropical or, Mm -hmm. you know, you just, if you don't know, you kind of get things in your mind that, don't turn out to be right. Right. <laughs> um, how did you get started doing that? And and have you been able to, you know, do anything more formally with that end of your interests? Um, I started going to the beach a lot because, I mean, we're in Seattle. We're just the beach is just right over there yeah. um, for low tides. And the beach naturalist, the Seattle Aquarium has beach naturalists out during the lowest low tides. And so there's always somebody pointing something out whether it's an octopus or um yeah, everything flatworms yeah it's just, they, it's just, they, it's just open I, and I went to the beach every year when I was little I mean growing up every single year and I had no idea that all these things existed um and so that's how I got introduced to nudibranchs because they were just they're always I mean they're sometimes hard to find but the the most common one is this um this thick horn nudibranch and it is just like this flamboyant brown and orange. And it's like, it's got, it's just really a fancy nudibranch and it's super common. And so to like be introduced to that species, it's just like mind blowing. It's like that thing lives here. <laughs> and then that just like, like the slime molten opened a whole new door. Cause that was something I had no idea about anything about it. And to say it's a slug, it's, it's, it's a sea slug. It's yeah. just like people, are like, oh, it's a slug, but you see them and people's, their minds just like, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I started to like, look like a slug, no, like you think of a slug. And... I mean, if you break down the anatomy, they do because they have the foot and yeah. you know, like the mantle and yeah. stuff. But, but they don't. Yeah, they're they're, they're so flamboyant, and so different. And so I started just obsessively looking for it because I get obsessive over things, um, and going to docks and then going to low tides and going to different locations and and pretty soon I amassed and I even went to California and drove to California to go to um, a famous. Um, <laughs> slime will I mean um nudibranch place down there just to find them um and so yeah so I just I'm, I'm still completely obsessed in fact that's what I want to write for my next book so <laughs> oh yay good we'll see yeah Working I was gonna that. ask you that later so well, that's okay <laughs> so is that are they something that you can see all along the west coast are they oh, yeah. something that that likes like quieter water like like Puget Sound or they they vary 
there's different species. Some of they're like there's some deep deep sea species. There's species yeah. that live in the ice. There are species that like tide pools. There are species that you can only see by diving. So they're kind of all over. It, it depends on the species. Um, there are certain areas where you're more likely to see them. Like floating docks are one of my favorite places um, because the floating docks have a whole habitat in themselves. And a lot of times the nudibranchs are hanging out there because they're all predators. So if you know what their food source is, yeah. you can often yeah. find them. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, you can find them in all kinds of places. And a lot of times they wash up on the shoreline too. So there's some that are um, pelagic and they feed on barnacles. So when the barnacles wash up, and I haven't found them yet, I want to, but there's um, a species yeah. that you can find washed up okay. too. So. I'll keep looking because I we do tide pulling on the Oregon coast and mm -hmm. I have never seen, I don't think I've ever seen one. You know, we've seen all kinds of other stuff, but. They're, I, they're I hard to find. I think you're thinking, I want to find a new <laughs> They're not. They're like like when I went to California, they were it was like shooting fish in a barrel. They were so easy to see. But um other places you have to really work for it. And you have to when they're out of the water, they look like blobs. They're just like uh, a blob yeah. of nothingness. Yeah, but when they're in the water, that. you know, then they're surrounded and yeah. the radophores yeah. are out and they look more beautiful. But um, so yeah, it's really you really have to kind of get your eyes in to figure out where they are and you know what they look like in and out of the water. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about your next book then. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So I brought supplies because one of the chapters in Kelly's book is a terrarium. And I have been obsessing about terrariums and watching TikTok videos on terrariums. So I'm like, I want to do a project. <laughs> Let's do a terrarium. <laughs> so I, I went ahead and assembled so so in Kelly's book, she talks about the different layers. She talks about rocks at the bottom, but not too big because you don't want the dirt to fall through. And she talks about uh, horticultural charcoal, which mm -hmm. I couldn't find. So I have fish tank charcoal. We have no <laughs> idea whether that would work properly. <laughs> and then dirt, I'm curious, like you had said in the book that you could just use like background dirt or backyard kind mm -hmm. of dirt. But is there a better dirt for that closed environment of a terrarium than others? or? I mean, really... I guess it depends on what type of terrarium you want to make. Like if you're going to make a, an arid cactus terrarium, you're not going to want to use, you know, potting soil. Right, um, right. I use, I've used a mix of potting soil and just dirt from your own backyard. Because the thing about dirt from your own backyard, the soil is full of microbes and yeah, possibly yeah. insect larvae and whatever else. So you could get like a whole menagerie just coming up yeah, from the soil. Yeah. Um, here I can show you mine. I, I brought it over here. Oh, yeah. So this is oh. one that I made um, <laughs> and there's a Moomin. Can you see Moomin? <laughs> I put a Moomin figure in it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but um, a few days ago, we got lettuce from the grocery store and in the lettuce was a caterpillar. And I didn't know if it was a native caterpillar or not. So I put it in here and you probably, can you see up here? Where is it? Right there. Oh yeah. Yeah. It spun a cocoon and now it's like pupating. So right at the top of the jar. Yeah, yeah, I see that. I now have um, something that will emerge at some point Yay. in time. You'll uh, have some kind of mystery. Okay. This is the second one that I made um, of moss. Oh, that's pretty, yeah. So I did a study, I did a study, I did a um, survey because my back was bad. So I spent a lot of time walking around the park. And so I collected all these moss samples to look for tardigrades in them. And when I was done, I thought, I don't want to just throw the moss back outside. So I made this um, with all the different mosses that I had, and lichens that I had collected for the yeah. moss or for the like um, tardigrades. And I collected oh, 12 of fun. them. And do you want to now, guess how did many? You, um, I noticed that one of them look, well, one of them's covered with like screening. Yep. Cause that was because of the caterpillar. Yeah. Yep. Do you leave them open? Or do you seal it them? It depends on what you put in it. Okay. So if you had like roly polies, you wouldn't need to seal it. But if you have a caterpillar, it's going to climb out. Right, and, right. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't have to like cover it with like plastic wrap or anything to keep the moisture in? No, no, it stays pretty moist. In fact, I overwatered that one um, when I first started it. <laughs> one of the I had a little strawberry plant in it that died. So um, yeah, the moisture stays pretty, pretty good. Okay. But again, it depends on the, the exact type. Like this is, you know, Pacific Northwest. So, and I have just sedums in there. But yeah. if you were doing something more, you know, humid, maybe you need to cover it. You kind of just have to experiment.
I think you've gone mute. I can't hear you anymore. Yes, I did. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> when you were prepping for the book and, you know, trying out all the all the experiments and everything. <laughs> did you have did you have one that was really gave you fits to have to try to figure out how to explain it well? Um, and then did you also have like a favorite one that you just really enjoyed doing. Um well I had a lot of trouble with face mites. I've tried it and I tried it. I still haven't found my own face mites. So um that one didn't give me fits describing it. <laughs> this gave me fits actually doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, trying to think. There were a couple of the, the activities that the I had a hard time describing. Um, because writing directions is actually not as easy as you no. know. <laughs> so. It's not. It's not. It's um surprisingly hard. So that's why I was wondering. You know how did it, how did it. You know, if you had something that you thought, oh, well, this isn't going to be difficult to describe. And then you were like, oh, yeah, well, OK, maybe. Yes, it is. Yeah, I, th I think it's just like as a whole, all of them were a bit challenging because you have to really yeah, think yeah. about it. And I have to think because, I mean, I've my brain's very naturalist oriented. So, yeah, yeah, I don't have to think I, I had to step back and say, what would people not know? So and that's why yeah, we have editors, yeah. editors, are, editors are graded. Like, what? Do, yes. What, what yes, is that? that? <laughs> I think we don't know how this. <laughs> yeah, no, I that is something that I've struggled with too. Writing is, um, and I had a really great editor point out: you're doing all these, you know, breaks in logic where you know where it's going, but your reader's not going to know what the heck <laughs> they're going on this ride with you, and suddenly you jump three things ahead, and now they're very. <laughs> And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I can see that. <laughs> but yeah, it's particularly when you're writing directions. It's mm -hmm. it's like the exercise when you're a kid, if they make you describe how to make a peanut butter sandwich. Right, right. And, you know, it's like, how much can you assume that your audience can just know? Mm -hmm. And how much are you, do you have to explain, like, very carefully, step by step? Right. And I also don't want don't to insult the readers by saying that, you know, well, of course, they're stupid. They don't know this. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't like being, you know, talked down to as a reader either. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it is an interesting sort of juxtaposition of giving the right amount of information, but not too much, but not too mm -hmm. little, not assuming anything, but also <laughs> not assuming that people are dumb. And <laughs> being a writer in a nutshell. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> Yeah, because that happens in fiction too, where you're yep, you've got to know what can you assume. What are shortcuts that you can use that people will understand, and what shortcuts will they not understand? And yeah, so I'm just shoving things in here that I <laughs> brought outside. I have little pieces of wood, and yep. I have brought in a violet because I have a bunch of violets that have kind of naturalized in my yard. Mm -hmm. The wood's good. The wood and rocks and and like you don't need any um, like a dish of water because invertebrates most of them um, absorb moisture from the air. They don't yeah. like drink like a dog. So as long as you're keeping it moist, um, yeah. And then it kind of depends on what you want to what your goal is. Like, is it just to, like hold a roly poly for a few days, or do you want to like yeah. raise a butterfly from caterpillar to um, adult and do you want to like watch a spider eat things? It's <laughs> oh, always, always. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did that when I was when I was writing Nature Obscura. I kept spiders for a while on my desk. Oh yeah. Only I put um two together temporarily. To <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and one um attacked and ate the other one. Good roommates. <laughs> no, they were not. <laughs> one was no longer. <laughs> and then I felt bad. I felt so bad. I was sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I so didn't mean to like have a gladiator death match here. What kind of spiders were they? Um, I don't remember now. That was quite a long time ago. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, we talk about the uh, 
the uh, the cycle of publishing and how you oh. get a book comes out and a lot of times we're on to our next project and it's yep. like, oh shoot what was, right. you know, what was where did I learn that or how did I what happened or what page was that yeah. I don't <laughs> I'm pretty sure one was a false widow I don't know what the other one was now because I have a bunch of false widows in the basement I had a lot of fun watching them yeah they're very cool so what are you working on now? I know you've been having to not do as much stuff as you normally do. So have you had projects that you're working on while you're waiting for everything to get back to normal? <laughs> well, my back repairs itself. Um, yeah. No, I've, so the last few months I've been um, working on um but um so for my book events which actually get to happen this time not like my last book yeah I yeah. wanted to make um these mobile curiosity cabinet to go with me to different events and so I've been making these displays of um if I've got one here like this one's a lichen display oh very cool so I've got lichens I've got slime molds I've got um uh the like a pressed plant display um one that's all um the life cycle of an alder so i've got like alder buds and alder leaves and branches and stuff with lichens on them um and then like an actual like an old jewelry box that i had found at goodwill and i sanded it down and now i'm making it into like a little tiny or not tiny it's actually kind of big into like a cabinet so people can open it and look in drawers and kind of oh, that's one of the cool. projects in the book this one the last one yeah. is um making a curiosity cabinet so I'm going to have this mobile curiosity cabinet. And um, so I've kind of been working on that since my back's been bad, I can only stand. <laughs> that was something yeah, I can do while standing. Yeah. Um, so now that my back's getting better, I'm starting to work again more on my, my new to brain book. And then I've also been working for the last couple of years, three or four years, maybe on um, a novel about a pirate oh, naturalist. Yeah. So, Oh, that's fine. Uh, so I'll be working on those again, hopefully soon. Yeah. Now that I can sit again a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how, what do you generally make? Talk about the curio cabinets, because I, I know that when, when you were um, featured on Oregon Field Guide and you had your slime mold collection, I was just like, oh my gosh, that's Sorry. so cool. I wanted to they're over there. Yeah. Yeah. Over there. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, she's got like drawers with all the little compartments and I was exceedingly um, jealous and I just thought it was so cool, but you pulled something out that you've obviously worked on and made. Do you repurpose stuff or do you make them from scratch or both? Yeah, no, a lot. Like you can see my cabinets behind me. I'd say like 70, 80% of the stuff in there is from Goodwill. <laughs> like all the jars and the boxes and a lot of the books too, oh, the vintage old books. Cute. Um okay. Um, yeah, all like the little things you can see behind me. I mean, not that not the actual nature items, those are things I found right, out right. In, you know, nature, the fossils <laughs> and turtle shell and fox jaw and whatever. Um but yeah, even that globe was from Goodwill. So. <laughs> but oh, yeah, no, cool. I love to repurpose things because I mean, they're going to just be sitting there, be thrown away. Spice jars, um, all, yeah. all kinds of jars, like, you know, the jar from the terrariums I just showed you, those are both from Goodwill. Um, so yeah, I'm a huge fan of repurposing. And it's because it doesn't have to be expensive either to be a naturalist. You can go to Goodwill yeah. and buy, like, that's the, what, like all the materials in here. Almost everything in here is stuff you can find at a thrift store or in your cabinets. There's a few odd, you know, like specialty things like a microscope for tardigrades. There's no getting around that. Um, yeah. But I wanted to like, I wanted to make it so accessible for everybody um, to get out and, you know, be a naturalist. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, um, the one that I saw that has the, the, like the wooden box and then all the uh, little dividers, mm -hmm. did you find that somewhere? Or did you construct all the little dividers? That, so the one in the video? No, the one, oh, the, the one, one that I just made. Or that I just the lichens, doing? yeah. Yeah, that was just a box I found at Goodwill. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then I just glued the lichens in it and labeled them, and then I cut a piece of plexiglass to go on top. Um, okay, okay. To keep the dust out and whatnot. So yeah, and, and then I did you, another one. Do you glue the glue down the plexiglass just to keep it? I screwed it on because I wanted to be able to open it again. Oh, and this one yeah. is um, slime molds. Oh, very cool. So these is are actually in 
Are the dividers something that were already there? Or did you Yeah, no, the dividers were already there and it was perfect because these are actually the boxes that I keep the slime molds in and they fit. Oh like, my gosh. Ex- yeah. <laughs> I was just like, oh, I'm so excited. Like this the heavens perfect. opened. Yeah. <laughs> And so I didn't have to take the slime molds out of the little boxes. So someday if I want to take this apart again, I can just take the boxes back out and put them back in my drawers. Yeah. yeah. But for this, I wanted to have a display so that anybody can see. And I have a magnifying glass to go with it too, since they're really small. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's another Goodwill find. I mean, I I guess I'm going to have to start going to Goodwill a bunch more. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. No, I, yeah. Like I love, I love all the thrift store finds. I even yeah. find nature stuff there. I found like a little jar of shark teeth. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm like, this is a completely random thing. I actually bought this little jar of shells and inside of it was a little bag of shark's teeth. So you never know what you're going to find. Yeah. <laughs> so I am wondering if I'm going to type into the chat over here. It's going to be a little delayed, um, but I'm wondering, I'm going to pop over and ask. ask if anybody has any questions that they want to ask. So what was the hardest chapter to write in this book? Um, That might have been the um, learning the language of nature, because that's an activity that I kind of made up myself. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Everything else is more or less a standard sort of activity except for maybe the bathyscope that's kind of one that's I mean it's this thing but it's not a thing that's very common anymore um but yeah I'd say the the language of nature and also curiosity cabinet because I (laughs) the editors cut my chapter down because I had way too much information historical information about the curiosity cabinets because it's fascinating um yeah so those are probably the hardest to to write um yeah so new to Brank's next maybe and novels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Are you still um, out looking for slime molds and doing all that sort of thing? Yeah, well, my back's better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. I, yeah, I was, in fact, I wanted to go to California again to do um, more new to Brank research, but I can't handle a car road trip right yeah, now. That's so that's going to have to wait till next year. Um, so. Yeah, I think next year is going to be the year of new to Brank. So I'm going to hopefully go take like a coastal tour down to California and back. And then also I want to go to Hawaii because of a lot of species that I want to write about that are um, like live in Japan or other areas. And so Hawaii is probably the closest I can get yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on a writer's salary. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, ideally I'd love to go to Japan and, you know, go over to yes. Korea. And <laughs> that would be so cool. But uh, um, realistically, when you because slime molds are something that I think people probably have seen and not realize mm-hmm. that they have seen. So can you talk a little bit about, well, maybe refresh people's memory um, of what a slime mold is and then um, talk about ways that you can, you know, what to look for when they're out looking. The slime molds are mixed with my CDs. So they're their own kind of, they live on their own. They're not related to anything else. They don't, they're not fungus. They're not animal. Although they were kind of bounced back and forth by historic um, scientists. Um, and they're small, very, 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 very small. Like I said, I showed you the box, right? So, I mean, you can see the bits of wood, but it's hard to see the actual slime molds on yeah, them. Yeah. Um, some of them are very colorful. Like there's some that are bright pink. Um, and they often grow in masses. So you'll, it's not just like one little stalk. So you'll see kind of a, a yeah. blob of pink, um, but they look very superficially like fungus. So a lot of people will look at them and say, that's a fungus. It's a, not a mushroom, yeah. but it's just yeah. a tiny fungus. Um, but they're not, they, they have a stalk and they have um, like, instead of like a flat mushroom shape, they kind of usually, it's more like an orb or ball. Sometimes they're just right. directly onto the wood. Um, but they're very small. So my trick is to k- take, I always have a, um, a little pen light, a waterproof one. And because even if it's like, cause they like to grow in the forest where it's dark. So it's hard to see and they're small. So um, 
even if it looks like the log is light and there's nothing on there, if I shine a lot of light on there, it, <laughs> pun intended, it's illuminating. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. There's so much that shows up under a simple light that you can't see with your bare eye. Um, and so I just look for them on, they love dead wood. They like to grow on dead yeah. wood, um, dead leaves. Um, that's the best places for me that I found them. But yeah, using the, using a flashlight and looking, you have to like really get down there and get close yeah. to the wood. You can't just like walk by and say, there's nothing there. And they look, I don't even know how to describe this because now to me, when I see them, they do look different from fungus, mm -hmm. but it's, but the growth habit is, is very similar. Like I've not gone looking too much in the forest for them, but I do have slime molds that will like grow out of the deck boards. If, you know, if we have a deck board mm -hmm. that's starting to rot, then this, you only see these little tiny orangey or pink bubbles, you know, mm -hmm. growing out. But is there a way to describe how they look that's different from a fungus that maybe somebody would be able to make it easier for people to find them? Well, they never have gills. And most mushrooms have some sort of gills, whether it's like yeah. the branch gills or the porous gills on the underside. Yeah. And slime molds are often very symmetrical. So like there's some that are that are very tall and slender, but they're they're oblong. They're 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 you know a shape. They're not flat on one side and you know like mushrooms are usually like except for maybe puffballs but yeah. they're they're um not symmetrical um and so they're very small very i mean there's some fungus that are that small but generally fungus are not that small slime molds are often much more colorful like they're pink um some of them are iridescent um some are white some are <laughs> some look like um pretzels like like grow, grow like on the Stripped right on the log like pretzels and those are some of the trickier ones um yeah it's hard to describe because <laughs> without yeah. us like seeing them seeing pictures of them side by yeah. side um but they, yeah once you once they, you get a knife for like, it they're almost more gelatinous in a way than mushrooms are or some a few that i have around my house are a little bit more gelatinous the, looking the so there's a the plasmodium which is the growth stage and then there's the sporangia which is like the fruiting body the fruiting body is actually they're kind of hard and so if i poke it and it's really yeah. gooey and spongy then and it's a fruiting body then it's a fungus because they're going to be damp and and kind of gooey but the slime molds are usually dry and they have um because the, the bodies once they because that's how i can preserve them they get dried out Oh, interesting. And they have the spores okay. inside. So, and they'll, they'll last forever. Um, as long as I don't drop them, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, the, the fruiting bodies of slime mold are definitely kind of harder and, um, yeah, fungus is definitely gooier, at least yeah. in the fruiting body. But yeah, so go look outside. <laughs> you never know what you might see. <laughs> I didn't have any questions pop up. So I think that we can probably tie up. I really, really appreciate you hanging out and showing me all your cool stuff and helping me build my <laughs> little terrarium. And yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm hopeful that you'll be able to get out and about the next year and do all kinds of fun stuff and not be stuck at home. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.